Hey. Andy Gears, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. I want to start with a Facebook post that you posted, I think, sometime at the end of 2023. In the post, you said that you spent nearly 19 and a half years trying to build a Bible-based video game. Why? <laughs> yeah, well, that is... Why really is it so important to you? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I was um, kind of digging into my old blog uh, in order to make that video that I'd made, and, and I found mm -hmm. my kind of original, like, announcement post back on my live journal can you believe it that's how old it was um back in january 2005 and um i'd, I'd been to this sort of youth worker conference um and we'd studied the book of ruth and it's like a really short little story in the bible um but i came away so kind of encouraged by all these amazing truths i'd learned about god's character um and i think it just it really kind of amazed me and uh, sort of taught me, I suppose, that, that stories can be so powerful for teaching us about God. And mm. um, I'd grown up playing loads of story-based games, so particularly like the Monkey Island games were the ones that were mm. kind of in mind at the time. And I just thought, wouldn't it be great to, to sort of use a, a story-based game like that, but to teach a story about God? Um, and I thought it could be a great way of engaging people who perhaps wouldn't normally read the Bible or, or people who like less committed to reading the bible anyway and um it's a really fun way to learn about god so that that kind of kicked off my journey i didn't really have much experience of successfully making games by that point i'd spent most of my life trying to make games and and failing um so i didn't really know what i was doing i didn't have any money or experience or skills or anything uh, just this passion really um and uh i spent about 10 years trying to pursue that kind of Monkey Island based, so point and click adventure game about one particular Bible story. Um, I think originally I probably was trying to do David and Goliath, which is a bit cliched. And I sort of thought, oh, everyone, everyone tries to make David and Goliath games. So I, I eventually settled on going a few chapters earlier to 1 Samuel, sort of 8 to 12, where Saul becomes king. Um, and uh, it was hard, really, really hard. I felt like at every single stage, it was like trying to get blood out of a stone. Like, I, I, I think I quickly realized that, like, games like Monkey Island, so many of the puzzles are based around, mm -hmm. like, stealing something or <laughs> deceiving someone or just generally doing things that you probably don't want to incorporate into a, a kind of Christian game like that. Um, so, so coming up with puzzles that were interesting and yet still kind of funny and, and engaging, uh, just really hard. Yeah, I had some friends who yeah. helped me to meet up like once a month for a, a drink and a, a kind of <laughs> a session of trying <laughs> to figure out the puzzles. But even with their help, you know, yeah, 10 years in, I still just felt I was getting nowhere and um, kind of it really just, yeah, fizzled out. <laughs> What's your background? Like, are you a developer? Uh, yeah, so I, I've i been, like, programming computers since I was about five. My dad bought me this mm -hmm. magazine uh, called Let's Compute, which is sort of teaching kids how to code. And unsurprisingly, it went bust after about 12 issues, I think. Um, and, um, but I've always been into coding, so I've loved that. And mm -hmm. um, so most of my professional career has been as a software developer. Um, I think I did like in order to pursue this Christian game idea or Bible-based game idea, I did sort of try my best to get a, a job in the games industry, uh, mm -hmm. but it never really worked out. So I just ended up in sort of web development mainly. So working for like a newspaper company or a visual effects uh, company or a um, food delivery company. Uh, so all sorts of different places, but um, yeah. And how long have you been in the CGDC? Yeah, well, I suppose pretty early on, I, I, I thought, well, there must be other people out there with a kind of interest in making Bible-based games like this. Um, so I sort of found the Christian Developers Network yeah. back in the day. And um, and I went to the Christian Game Developers Conference in when it was in Oregon back in 2011, I think. It was sort of, yeah, the kind of climax of, of those efforts to make that game on about one Samuel, I think I'd got a sort of a bit of a, a kind of prototype of, of, of a game. Um, 
uh, so I flew out to Oregon to to show it to people, and that's where I I, I met a, yeah a few people in the community and um, things like that. But uh, yeah, it, you know, ironically, that was really just at the point that I was sort of starting to give up on that idea. So I never yeah I haven't been back since until last year when I was able to kind of bring our, our latest project, the Serpent and the Seed, um, and uh, engage with people again. So talk about that period uh, be- between the two games. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think what happened is I I had this sort of 10-week, um, uh, sorry, not 10-week, ten 10-day ten sort of holiday. Uh, I was studying at Bible College at that point, and um, okay. I, I, I've I met with my prayer group at Bible College. Who, like, they were very patient with me. Week by week, I was saying, "Oh, pray for this computer game I'm trying to make." And obviously, I was going nowhere fast. And uh, I said to them, "I've got this ten-day break. Um, I could just put another ten days into the game, and uh, or I've got this other idea for a project, which is I really want to make a an app to help people pray." Um, mm. And they asked me a few questions about that idea, and and in the end, they they said, "We think you should." give this prayer prayer app idea a go um so i um i spent those 10 days building the app which would become prayer mate which um uh, you know by the end of 10 days i actually had a fully working prototype within a month it was live nice. on the app store and within a couple of years wow. it had about a hundred thousand downloads and oh wow um, it that just really took off in a way that the game never did um and it just it, increasingly it felt like that was there was a lot more kind of return on my investment for yeah. time spent on, on that. Um, and uh, so, yeah, the, I suppose that's why the game sort of fell by the wayside a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I've, it, yeah, it's been such a blessing working on that to, to, to work on a project that is actually helping people and, um, you know, sort of getting emails from people saying how it's helped them in their relationship with God and, so that's just been a real blessing and through that i've actually you know after a few years it became evident that deserved a lot more of my full-time attention and so i went full-time on prayer mate in 2016 um, in large part supported by kind of donations from users of the app um, and uh, through that we set up a charity discipleship tech um, I, and even when i founded the charity in the back of my mind i was thinking like prayer mate is great but i would love at least the sort of flexibility to circle back to the game idea um so we we kind of gave it a slightly broader remit of of using technology to help people get to know god better was our sort of tagline um and um you know that's gone from strength to strength and we've there's a little team uh working with me on prayer mate as well so i have another full-time developer and a user support person um and so that in in the last few years that really sort of gave me the the flexibility and the the freedom to then sort of as that's reached a point of maturity i suppose take a step back and say right well maybe i can consider other projects like now and maybe this is maybe the time is right to sort of think about this game idea once again so did your did it feel like your dream died for a while uh yeah i I, in all honesty yeah i think that there definitely were moments where i thought what like it felt it felt hard definitely you know i'd yeah. i'd been so kind of convinced that this was a a kind of it really felt like a kind of god given vision that i'd like a, i had such a heart for for doing it i remained as convinced as ever that it it kind of could work and um if if done well I, it'd be brilliant i I'd, I'd had and i'd had various other kind of ideas along the way which eventually actually did become like the serpent and the seed but i think in many ways my i i just didn't have quite that appetite to think about it anymore in the way that i yeah. it had been pretty all consuming in the early days and the, the thought of returning to that just didn't excite me or or appeal mm. um so um yeah um i, I it it I, I suppose what reignited it was um during the lockdown um in 2020 i took part in a, a hackathon um that faith tech ran this thing called the global church uh covid hackathon i think something like that and um 
we worked with a local charity here called Cross Teach, who normally they would go into schools and run these things called the, well, they do like a, they do regular like weekly Bible clubs and stuff, but they would also mm-hmm. do these um, big events in, at Christmas and Easter called the, the, like the Christmas experience and the Easter experience. And, and their Easter experience was like a interactive, it was like a murder mystery version of the, the Easter story. So they have these different crime scenes, like the, there's this victim has been killed. So you go to the victim's last meal with his friends and mm-hmm. uh, one was the garden. And I think there was the, the trial and the, the grave and um, you sort of interview the eyewitnesses and uh, there's all these different people who like could be responsible, like his, his friend who was going to betray him or the judge who convicted him, even though he was innocent and the soldier who, who, thrust the spear into his side to finally kill him um but uh you know there's a twist as you discover it's actually all about jesus and and god had a plan all along and that kind of stuff so it was really fun but during covid they obviously couldn't go into schools to to do this in person and my wife had the idea of could we build a kind of digital online web version of this um and uh, we had a lot of fun over basically within a month we built the whole thing from start to finish um and uh that was just like well we had so much fun doing it but it was also just a real eye-opener that if you get the scope of your project right and if you kind of choose your art style carefully and like it doesn't have to take 10 years to fail to make a computer <laughs> game like, and actually yeah. do something meaningful in 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 a sort of short time period and yeah that i think that just that the little spark kind of came alive again of like oh yeah maybe, maybe this is something that I've probably learned a few things along the way that make it a bit more feasible now. I think it's kind of really common. We we see it in the Bible too, like um, God gives you a dream and then for a period it seems like it, it, it dies. Um, mm-hmm. I also tried to get into games like as soon as I could, uh, but it felt like the door just kept shutting for various reasons. Um, mm-hmm. So I t- also took a kind of a side journey. I started a design studio and did that for about a decade and then eventually was able to get into games. Um, But I feel like personally, I've had to lay my dream of making games down a few times and and it's been painful and and, and hard. Um, Mm -hmm. But then God has had me like pick it back up after I've laid it at his feet. Um, Mm -hmm. It's something that... uh, I don't know. I don't know if if we talk enough about it. Um, people don't. People don't have a linear path, right? Like God's yeah. meandering all over and teaching us things and cutting on us and preparing us. Mm. And I just think of like uh, the story of Joseph and mm. Abraham and Moses. Like they're they're like this messy journeys with twists and turns, and um, but God works yeah. it all out in the end. Definitely. I've always loved that story of Joseph, especially like, yeah. <clears throat> and um, yeah, that came to mind for me too, when you were mentioning that, like, you know, he's got that dream early on, doesn't he, of the, like, the people bowing down to him, but um, it, it's a, he has to go to, yeah, get sh- shipped into slavery and spend years in prison. And um, like, he has to do a lot of growing up before he's ready to be used by God, doesn't he? And um, yeah, I think, I suppose there is a certain naivety that that came with that that vision when I was like I thought oh I'm the I'm the perfect person to do this with my sort of background in both sort of making well trying to make games my love of games anyway and and my kind of coding skills but um, I suppose you never you, you're not really ever aware of how much you don't know do you and like you know I just I it it's quite it's quite a skill learning how to finish a project. And yeah. like I had never finished anything in my life, so <laughs> I think it's um, yeah, you know, I had I had a lot to learn before I could really pursue that. Uh, so let's talk about your your app. Is your app? Um, it sounds like it's the success of your app is actually enabling you to work on your your game now, right? Yeah, very much so. I mean. <laughs> Like from a purely financial point of view, the mm-hmm. the app is really what sort of is the main 
provider for our charity i suppose so like you know well, through the like there's a bit of there's a mixture of um churches and charities can pay a subscription to to share prayer mm-hmm. feeds through the app but then also people who benefit from the app who who then donate um so yeah that that basically pays my salary um uh mm-hmm. um and it's also you know through the charitable structure through that we've been able to raise various charitable grants that have then funded the, the game project um but i think yeah i mean in a sort of softer <laughs> skills kind of sense <laughs> it's like it it's very much through developing that app that i've i've learned a lot more about the process of like how do you actually take an idea through to fulfillment i mean because you know even adding a single feature to an app it, it mm-hmm. is is a project in its own right isn't it you know you have to come up yeah. with the idea yeah. you kind of plan there's always a million different ways you could sort of skin a, a cat in terms of mm-hmm. uh like how we're going to approach so adding that feature um and then pursuing that through to completion and um and then marketing it i suppose getting you know it's not enough to add a feature you need to persuade your users to try it out and use it and, and support it and stuff mm-hmm. so um, so I, yeah, I think sort of, uh, when did it, so I started it in 2011, started this game project. It was about 10 years, basically between, I had 10 years of working on prayer mate before coming back to the game idea. So I think yeah, along the way, I'd learned a lot of really important, valuable skills about, yeah, completing projects. So it sounds like you picked up a lot of skills. Um, in addition to that, what's, what's different now? Is it? Do you feel like you have some more anointing for it or some things have changed? Yeah, I, I mean, it's a coming together of things. I I, uh-huh. I think without a shadow of a doubt, I could not have made the game we're making now 20 years ago. Um, mm-hmm. I, think, I, I, I think back then I was trying to make a very kind of different type of game like I wouldn't say exactly a kind of really literal game I was I always knew it needed something that like, games have to be fun don't they and I, I think in the case of Monkey Island it's the humor and the sort of comedy of it that, that makes it fun so I you know I suppose even then I, I it's not like I was going to do a really straight telling of the bible story I thought you know but it, it was probably going to be a little bit more literal I think I think I've kind of grown as a person and yeah i think this project we're pursuing now is a lot more sort of poetic and there's a lot more kind of imagery and uh, i've got some really amazing music from some um uh, yeah, team called poor bishop hooper who um it's just it's yeah really kind of stunning music and stuff but i i think a lot of that has come from maturity that i lacked 20 years ago i, I don't think i would have been able to make this kind of game so I, I think there's definitely that side of things I think um it was also like connections and um you know a lot of the people we're working on this game like some of them actually I did meet during my last kind of attempt to make a game so mm-hmm. we've been really privileged to work with a game designer called Dan Gould who um uh he was a game de- designer for some sort of AAA studios and then uh, he left that to go to theological college and became a missionary for a while, and and now for the last for the last decade or so has been working as a freelance graphic designer. Really, but um, he was someone who I connected with right at the end of my last effort, but didn't have any money to sort of pay to work with him. Um, so it's been he's been a real godsend this time around, and uh, also working with John Collins from the um, CGDC mm-hmm. community. He's yeah. been doing some the coding for us and um uh yeah artists and people so there's quite a few people who things like that where i just didn't have those connections like yeah um yeah but also i suppose the some of the things that i've learned um i spent a lot i wasted so much time last time trying to find an artist trying to find musicians or whatever because in my mind, you know, that's what made a computer game was beautiful artwork and um, things like that. And I wasted so much time. I, I, I wasted quite a lot of money, to be honest. Like not always even my own money either. 
like getting some concept <laughs> art, which I look back and I think, yeah. why did I yeah. even go near concept art when I didn't, I'd never prototyped the game. I didn't, you know, I think that's been the big learning curve, even with this game, <clears throat> I sort of very quickly moved towards concept art and stuff. And I'm like, I should have just focused on bit, prototyping the game using stickmen and <laughs> wireframes and, and just work out, is it any good? And then, because you don't even know what concept art you need until you yeah exactly of... And it, it felt like it would have been a, a sort of long way round to, yeah. to to build all the things. It felt like, but that's delaying what I really want to do, which is to build the big kind of dream project. But I do I do think I could have um, I could have shortcutted a lot of the process if I had learned some of those lessons sooner. But um, you know, if I just sort of picked a smaller game learned some of those well because apart from anything else through it's through launching projects that you you kind of gain more of a reputation as well and then it becomes easier to get people on board because they mm. it's a bit easier to get people to take you seriously if you've got a proven track record and i think i would have learned some of their like how to do animation or how to you know have, yeah more creative ways to tell a story um i think there are there are I, there's so many like, you know, a point and click adventure game is one fantastic way of telling a story, but actually there are some fantastic, much simpler games that also tell stories. So I think, you know, with a bit more vision, I could have, I could have found other ways to get into that world, I think. Um, yeah. When I've had to lay down my dreams, it's kind of been a, like a tender spot, right? I, I think you, uh, you said you didn't have interest uh, for a while or, or you couldn't necessarily think about. I know for me, it's 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 one of those things that you uh, kind of, I don't know, dance around, you kind of avoid a little bit because it's tender. When you thought about starting on Serpent in the Seed, um, what was your conversation with God like? Uh, were you were you talking to, were you asking for permission or what was that conversation like? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think, yeah, I don't, I don't, I suppose this time I don't, I don't think I went in with this sort of quite such a strong sense of like, this is what God wants me to do with my life. Mm. Um, I think it was more of a, like, okay, God, I've got an afternoon. I'm, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to spend this afternoon and just try and come up with, I, and I, I pretty quickly latched onto this idea of um, wanting to do a Bible overview um, mm. for people who don't read the Bible. That was like my sort of starting point because I had got really inspired by some research that had been done by the Bible Society here. He'd, they've surveyed 20,000 UK adults into attitudes to the Bible. And their big kind of headline stat was that one in four UK adults were kind of open to reading the Bible. Um, but they also identified some sort of impediments that stopped them, like particularly not seeing the big picture of the Bible <clears throat> and how it fits together, um, not seeing how it's relevant. So that, that kind of... Ex I, I was ex I've been excited for a few years by that and like seeing the the need, seeing the opportunity and thinking games could be a great way to help with that. And so I <clears throat> I had this afternoon, I said, right, okay, God, I've got an afternoon. I'd like to try and come up with a kind of what would be a kind of four or five act structure for a Bible overview. Um and and I I I 
opened a Word document and started typing. And by the end of the afternoon, I'd come up with a, I think it was five acts initially, but it's like a five act Bible overview. And I was like, all right, well, that, that, that felt quite straightforward. <laughs> um, you know, that's probably like the first two years of, of the previous development uh, right there in an afternoon. And um, yeah, so I think step by step, you know, I reached out to Dan Gould, this game designer. I said, Look, I, I've got this idea. Do you want to chat about it? And and we met and um, he was like, oh, yeah, I'd love to work on this. It sounds really fun. And um, and but I think within a month, he'd kind of sketched out the shape of Act One, like where you, basically the Garden of Eden and the fall where you meet Adam and um, and yeah, we'd, we'd kind of pray together every time we met to chat about stuff. And so, you know, it was all done sort of in, in prayer, in conversation with God. Mm -hmm. But I, d I don't think I had at any point necessarily this sort of, this must happen. And this is, you know, I, I suppose that perhaps that had been a learning of like, let's just mm -hmm. knock on this door and, and kind of see what happens. I think, I suppose that the first big, really big milestone was like, having to raise our first bit of funding of like if we're going to pursue this i'm yeah, going to need to raise a bit of money and we applied for a grant um some, someone put us onto this website that gave sort of i think it was a they they gave 10k sort of seed funding to innovative evangelistic projects and um i filled out an application and 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 they they you know they, they approved it they gave us the money and i was like well you know that was easy <laughs> and mm -hmm. i think you know just we kept on knocking on different doors like i reached out to these musicians for bishop hooper and i said i i don't know if you do commissions and you're probably not interested in computer games if you do but we're trying to make this game about trees in the bible um <laughs> and they replied really quickly saying oh we'd love to be involved like we've just been thinking wouldn't it be cool to make an album about trees in the bible Wow, that's really, wow. I love those kind of little God incidences, but it, you know, it just, in, it felt so different from last time, where like, where last time at every single turn, it felt hard, and like, I wasn't getting anywhere. Mm -hmm. This time, it just felt like, at every turn, things were coming together really naturally, really straightforwardly, and um, uh, it just really felt like God was in it, and um, so... Yeah, it was, it was really, um, just really felt God's kind of presence with us, I suppose, as we worked on it. And um, ev everyone I shared the idea with seemed really excited by it. Like it, people seemed to sort of really see the potential and the, the opportunity and stuff. So, Tell me about the shift kind of in tone. You said the serpent and the seeds a lot more poetic than your original idea. Yeah, so, I mean, it's still very kind of clearly a kind of Bible-based, Bible overview kind of uh, project, mm -hmm. but but I think we're, we're trying to really lean into the, the kind of imagery and the poetry the poetry of, of the Bible. So, um, you know, Adam and Eve, when they're kicked out of the garden, they, like, literally fall out of the garden. And, um, you know, it's a small example, but it's a sort of, it's not like literal historical narrative um, in that sense, but but it is. It's kind of it's trying to tell. It's trying to communicate what's going on, but in a, engaging your emotions a bit more. And um, uh, yeah, I, I think the, the the music has turned out to be a really kind. Of, I, I quite early on, I thought it would be really great to have some songs in this game. I sort of wanted one song per chapter, and um, it's been an absolute dream working with Paul Bishop Hooper because they they really specialize in writing songs based on the scriptures and they oh. have this real kind of anointing like it's their, their music is just out of this world but um mm. so they they've written a song for each of the key turning points and and again it's very kind of yeah poetic and like it it gives the it it gives the whole game this this really kind of amazing quality um so yeah uh it's it, it's a kind of i i think early on i that this it's been really inspired by this secular game called sword and sorcery 
uh, which mm, came out on the really iPad, which was brand new in 2011. And but more than anything from that game, it was the it was just the fe- the tone and feel of that game that I was aiming for. Like it, there's something really, again, like quite otherworldly about it. You feel like yeah. this is something special, yeah. and it's quite hard to define, but put your finger on. But it, you know, it's not it. It, it's quite a silly game in certain places. The script is a bit daft at times, <laughs> but it, so, so it doesn't take itself too seriously. But at the same time, the sort of it's quite weighty, and you feel like this is something, yeah, unusual. And I love that. I love that quality to it because I was like, that's kind of what I'm trying to capture. Like the Bible is mm-hmm. the thing that's I, I started with is just this feel, basically. You know, <clears throat> the Bible is sort of electric almost, like it's a bit dangerous to read it you know people get thrown into prison for owning bibles and like it's going to change your life potentially to read this thing and it, it's accessible and anyone can just op- it's just opening the book it's just reading in one sense but it's also it's also there's a danger and an excitement to it um and that's kind of what i wanted to, to capture in, in this game and um yeah so when we finally kind of shared our very first demo of chapter one, I I knew that we'd succeeded when it like it mm. just felt like we'd kind of caught, caught that tone and feel. I think um, so. There's plenty of details that need working out still, but as like it mm-hmm. feel, the important quality is it, it feels right, and uh, yeah, it was really exciting. So last year you also posted a video. Uh, it was a really fantastic video talking about Ludo narrow narrative dissonance um, within games and specifically you're talking about what you were doing in, in your game the serpent and the seed what are some pitfalls game developers need to look out for when they're thinking about turning a the bible bible stories into games yeah so it's, it's been a bit of a hobby horse of mine for for the most of these sort of 20 years trying to make bible games that um but i think it's like we you know, we all have asked the story we're trying to tell through our game. And if it's a Bible story, you know, it's probably a particular Bible passage we have in mind. Um, but but what often gets neglected is this this idea of the Ludo narrative, which is the sort of implicit story that your game is perhaps subconsciously kind of communicating through the gameplay itself. So I think the example I gave them, I used in my video, was like Mario Kart, you know, the, the kind of, the Ludo narrative behind Mario Kart is that going faster is better and to be first is mm. best. And like, that's not kind of spelled out in the, in the dialogue. It's not like an explicit narrative, but it is like really, really clear from the, from the loop, from the gameplay. So it's a Ludo narrative. And, um, uh, yeah, I think like when, when people take Bibles, it seems to have in particular Bible stories, you, you take a Bible story and the most sort of obvious way to turn it into a game is like you you cast yourself as the main character. So the kind of, you know, there's a million games where you are Moses and you're trying to kind of lead the Israelites out of exile. Uh, not exile, what am I talking about? Anyway, out of Egypt. Um, and, uh, or like you are David and you're fighting Goliath. And, um, uh, and I think, you know, the, we were always being taught at church about the sort of like we're not the hero of the story like God is and the, the story of Dave and Goliath isn't really about us and how great you know how we can slay the giants in our life if only we have enough faith you know it's mm. it's really about like David isn't just any old Israelite he's God's anointed future king and you know we're more like the Israelites with knees knocking on the sidelines <laughs> like in need of a savior and I think the trouble is, you know, let's take a David and Goliath game. Like they tend, the most obvious kind of translation to a game is you've got some kind of slingshot and you kind of, you know, you swing it around to gain power, you aim it, you time it perfectly, and then you shoot your stone. And if you manage to get it when David's, when Goliath's shield is down, then then you win. And, um, you know, my son played one of these. There's, there is a, like one of my all time favorite Bible games is a David and Goliath mm-hmm. game. Righteous Tales, which I think is a brilliant game in so many ways. But my son came away from it and he, he was running around the house cheering and he was like, I killed Goliath first time. I killed Goliath first time. <laughs> and I was like, well, great. Good for you. But like, you know, the story of David and Goliath isn't 
look how brilliant we are like we you know it, it's about like david goes into it saying the lord saves not by sword and spear like it's not about how kind of skillful we are or how strong we are um he goes in trusting that that, that it's god who's going to deliver him and that, um when you know if you likewise if you fail to kill goliath you're like really despondent and sad like i'm not good enough i'm not strong enough. well that's kind of the point isn't it david wasn't strong enough um but god was able to use him anyway and um so i think yeah if we are like too naive in the, in the way we take a bible story and translate it into um into game format like you end up actually kind of teaching almost the opposite point from what the bible mm. passage was trying to teach um, yeah i think yeah um, to go back to that earlier idea like i think we're often with we're, we're not the hero of the story and we used to talk about moses is me syndrome that like i i want to be the hero of the story but like actually and i think games so often kind of lean into that and reinforce that kind of what i would say is an un unhelpful way of reading the bible um so yeah i, I even from that, that earliest project you know you were like you weren't Saul you were his little man servant going you know, I, I used to love kind of reading the passage and you often find these kind of minor characters in the narrative who like it was Saul traveling with his man servant to look for his lost donkeys or um you know when when David is invited to go and play the harp for Saul in his court there's just like some random stranger who suggests oh there's a chap called David why don't why don't we get him to play the harp and I so I was I was kind of trying to find all those little minor characters and basically construct a narrative where you you were that person and like we sort of slightly removed external observer um and uh yeah i i i i've always felt that that's a more helpful way to approach a bible game that like you are not the hero but you you're kind of witnessing events and mm. you're meeting the heroes yeah yeah, that's a that's a big problem. Is it when when you play the hero, uh, potentially you could change the outcome of the story, right? If you're not if you're not careful, like say, take a David and Goliath game for example. If you if you somehow fail to to hit him in time or however it's set up, the the story's changed. Yeah, yeah, and you know they make a good joke out of that in Righteous Tales. I think there's like a line like, "Oh, that's not how the story goes," but. Um... <laughs> yeah it, it it always feels a bit um unsatisfactory like, like i suppose especially there are so many bible stories that ultimately are about how god is sovereign and god is in charge and the yeah. whole point the bible passage is trying to teach is trust that you, you can't like god can't lose and but then if the whole game can be lost you're like well I, yeah that's really awkward and you know i, I suppose that it was in part was the appeal of the point and click adventure game is that that often ultimately you can't really change the outcome of the story and you know some people hate that about those games and much prefer ones with like branching narratives and alternative endings and i'm sure that could be done well as well but personally i i rather liked the kind of fact that the kind of main structure of the story was, was sort of pinned in place and um as as a as the sort of author of the story we could make sure it panned out the way it's supposed to um, why do you think the ludo narrative dissonance is like so common? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think in part it is just a neglected concept. So, like, lots yeah. of lots of developers don't even never heard of the idea. I'd never heard of the idea um, when I set off on this adventure. Um, secondly, I, it's really hard. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we we've, we've tried to do this well with the serpent and the seed, and. Um, it has made life 10 times harder for ourselves. You like the first idea we come up with is always much easier, but you're like, oh, but it doesn't really work. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, the thing is when you're doing like a David and Goliath game, you, you want there to be drama and you want there to be tension and you want that sort of sense of will they, won't they um, like that. That is what you need that in a game don't you like if there's no stakes, there's, you have no emotional investment and um so you know or adam and eve eating the fruit like it's the same problem like you you want the player to feel like there's a lot on the line here and 
like what's gonna get but it's really <laughs> really really hard to do um i think that's why this project has taken as long as it has because we've had to sort of put a lot more time and thought and prototype it we, we've tried i've tried at least four or five different iterations of that like the, the knowledge of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil that moment in genesis 3 and um i hope we're kind of getting closer now but it, it's sort of um yeah it's it's certainly not for the faint-hearted i think trying to I mean, it's much easier to just like, okay, let's come up with a story, let's come up with some fun gameplay, and they may be completely unrelated, and we'll sort of squash them together and hey, presto, there's a game. You know, you can do that very easily, um, but it, it it's harder to come up with games. And you know, that's one of the things you, you worked on uh, that Dragon Cancer, didn't you, Brock? And that, like, yeah, there's a moments in that which I which really stood out to me as like moments that did this so well, like um like where the the gameplay really kind of reinforces the the kind of the story or the the kind of mm -hmm. and you, you it's, it just when it when those moments happen it you, you can tell you've experienced something different and like it it just engages you in a completely on another level i came across this really fascinating study recently we've we've all heard the saying that actions speak louder than words. But there's a psychologist that has been studying this for years, and mm. they came up with this, it, it's called the 738-55% rule. And what they found out that in a conversation like this, we're communicating, only 7% of what's communicated to you is actually coming through what I'm saying, the actual content. 38% comes through my tone and then 55% comes through my body language and facial expressions. And so I've just been thinking about that in terms of like games too, like the, it's, it's that, that ludo narrative dissonance, right? The mechanics aren't communicating the same message as, as with the other parts of the game. Um, I think it's tied into that somehow I'm, I'm thinking about, but um but actions do really speak louder than, than words. But I think a lot of people are, are really focused on um, just the message, I guess. You know, I mean, they're, they feel a tremendous amount of pressure to almost put a sermon uh, in, into the game, right? And, and so. You know, it's, at the end of the day, it's got to be a game, hasn't it? Like, you, yeah. you like, it's always been my passion to teach the Bible through a game, but it has to be a game. Like, like what's, what's the point of making it a game if you're not maximizing the kind of things that are unique to games and, and that interactivity and stuff is obviously a huge part of that. And if it's just a sort of sermon <laughs> wrapped up in, in some game packaging, why not just have a sermon? Yeah. Jonathan Blow talks about that a lot. He talks about like, if I wanted to tell a story, I'd write a book. Um, mm -hmm. And this, the stuff that he does is like, he's very explicitly, like you said, like what is special about a game? Why does this need to be a game rather than a, than a sermon or a book or an essay or mm -hmm. whatever? His, um, his design reboot talk uh, was, was quite yeah. influential for me early on in this project. Cause he talks about how all games teach, like you've got, within the kind of realm of that world that of that game you know you, it has certain rules and and they are kind of truth for the duration of that game and and so like, like he says all games teach but the question is like what are they going to teach and i've just found that was really interesting coming from a kind of secular mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. game designer like yeah. even he's saying like games are teaching you things and and the big question is like, are we going to be teaching things that are beneficial for people or and what could be better than teaching you know things that are eternally true and like, the things of god so um yeah I thought it was cool to hear that coming even from a non-christian yeah so you're three years into development what advice do you have for people wanting to make a bible-based game and i'm specifically curious like what 
when you're thinking about making a segment of your game, like how are you approaching that? Are you are you praying about it beforehand? Are you reading the the scriptures different, you know, multiple times? Are you seeking out, you know, um, trusted sources? What kind of process are, are you going through? Yeah, yeah. And, I, you know, in some ways I think if I were to have those three years over again, my process would probably be a bit different. But, um, yeah, I mean, we've tried to do everything saturated with prayer. I think that is mm-hmm. definitely been the starting point. You know, we I sort of pray regularly with our artists and musicians and things. And um, uh, uh, so, yeah, trying to, because, yeah, I suppose Psalm 127 has always been really important to me. You know, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Yeah. I think. Like you could pour so much time into something and just get nowhere if God's not in it. So, so yeah, we've we've tried to, to start with prayer. I think it is it's always worth reading the Bible passage one more time. I think like we so we 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 so easily read the Bible through the lens of what we expect to find there, and mm-hmm. you know, like if I say how many how many of each animal did Noah have on the ark, we all instinctively want to say two, but like if you actually read it you know the clean animals he brought seven pairs of yeah. animals so that's like 14 isn't it and like that's we just don't imagine there being 14 sheep and 14 <laughs> like this that and the other so um like and I've, yeah I, I mean that's one of the things i did love about trying to make a game on one samuel i just read that book over and over again and i was always discovering new like connections or new kind of characters and i mean the bible is such a rich book isn't it and that like there's always more to discover um but yeah we've also tried to to read like listen to other resources and so for me i think quite early on i was sort of spotted that there was these trees in all of these so many of these bible stories Hmm. seem to involve trees i i sort of said online like has anyone ever read a good biblical theology of trees in the bible and someone put us onto the bible project who've done a series called the, the tree of life and um you know talking all about like how that their kind of hypothesis was that every major turning point in the bible there's a tree and um, mm. i was like wow this sounds yeah, i mean it was really fascinating Absolutely. like it blew my mind like listening to their podcast and obviously you've got the the tree of life and the what they call the tree of testing in, in eden yeah. and the tree of life comes back at the end of the bible in revelation 21 22 um uh Abraham so many of Abraham's big decisions happen by trees like yeah. you've got these oaks with Mamre and the various other things but I was like well what, what about David and Goliath like where's the trees and that but then you know David and Goliath takes place either side of this place called the Valley of Elah mm-hmm. and I was like well what, let me look at what is Elah and uh, sure enough it's Terebinth so like I suppose the image is this big valley with trees in the bottom and yeah. um there you go um uh jesus obviously you know cursed yeah. as the man who hangs on a tree so so that was you know that was mind-blowing for me and and really informed then the sort of shape of the rest of the project so um yeah love listening to that series and they recommended a few books as well on the topic as well so um and also like alongside it i i suppose quite early on as i said i had that kind of idea about how you know owning the bible can be a bit dangerous and people are kind of thrown into prison and so I've I've tried to do a lot of reading as well about like the the sort of persecuted church and uh Hmm. there's an excellent book called um I think it's Killing Fields Living Fields about the church in uh Vietnam I think um uh during the reign of Pol Pot and um uh yeah that was kind of you know in one sense completely something totally unrelated superficially to a bible overview but I think really helpful to sort of expand my horizons a bit in that and subsequently I've read another fantastic book about the that promise in Genesis 3 of like the seed of the woman who crushed the head of the seed of the serpent but mm-hmm. in particular how that's why that has been particularly relevant to the persecuted church through the ages mm-hmm. and like specifically connecting that kind of thread through the bible with with the persecuted church i thought i found that really um a bit of a sort of vindication almost of like 
uh, it's not just coincidence that I've sort of thought that this relates to that theme of persecution and like it's actually a, a sort of intrinsic in yeah. you've got that ongoing animosity between the seed yep. of the serpent and the seed of the woman and like that kind of persecution is always part and parcel of that promise and so it's, it's been uh, yeah it's, it's been helpful to sort of read more widely not just the specific passages and, and things that I'm focused on. Um, in terms of process then like, I think um, yeah so reading it we what we found works for us is we've we've settled on quite a sort of stable process now where so we start by reading the bible but then start with doing sort of basic sort of storyboarding like what what are the kind of key things happening like so you meet adam and you're going to help him name some animals and then you don't find a helper fit for him so and then he has a dream and eve gets created and things like that so we've we tried to sort of roughly storyboard those kind of key moments which mm -hmm. often it comes out fairly abstract like mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't tell you anything about well how many animals or which animals or like what where do you meet the animals but in storyboarding you know, would be different than like concept art right you said you were jumped to concept art too soon this is at a yeah, just kind yeah, of a yeah. higher level yeah so the storyboard i mean like for the garden of eden in the end like we had a storyboard that was basically here's a bunch of interactive elements that'd be really fun so like here's a okay. chameleon that will change color when you tap on it or a whale that will spurt water when you tap on it and okay. or a spider that goes where you tap and um it's quite abstract in one sense hmm. um and it it's not saying this is what it will look like but more this is roughly how it will function and okay um and what i've learned like the hard way is really i like that's enough to just get on and prototype it like so in two minutes really i can throw together a prototype of a i just cut out the artwork from that prototype of the chameleon and then when you tap it it changes color with a little sound effect and like immediately i was like oh this is really fun oh i'm gonna like i'm gonna keep tapping this chameleon and watch it change color and like it did, I didn't need any outside help to do that. Like, I didn't need an artist or like, you could very quickly discover which things were going to work, which things were going to be fun. Um, and, um, but then we've gone, to, we've, so, I've, so I think prototyping it as early as possible is definitely my big kind of learning point on this. And then, mm -hmm. but then we've done this sort of, that's where I've got our concept artist involved. He's done a bit of a level design thing of, okay, here are the different elements. And now let's make it a bit more concrete. Okay, so you're going to start in this sort of wooded glade and that's where you'll find the spider's web. And, and then we'll go into this sort of slightly more open scene and that's where you'll find the chameleon and the, the, the sloth and things like that. And, and then you'll meet Adam at the top of the hill. And so he, our concept artist has helped take these in sort of slightly abstract storyboards and turn them into a really concrete like this is the shape of the level and like there'll be a cliff here and then you'll walk down and there's a tree and okay. things like that so um and what's and the what's the state of the art at that at that point is it still pretty yeah um, well, i mean even in that like he he would do those storyboards super like rough so uh -huh. um i mean it's been interesting how like in the end our kind of the actual artist we've started working with this year you know it's only right at the end of this process so we we spent like two years prototyping the whole game in that really rough stick man form oh. and um it felt like hard going at times but mm -hmm. by the end of those two years i was like this you know we've now basically got a whole game and it makes sense and it's it's mu you're much less emotionally attached to it because you built yeah. it so quickly yeah. mm -hmm. like that bit just doesn't work or that bit's a bit boring or um and you know, sometimes you have to, it's like it's probably just because our prototype is not quite, you know, with the real music and the real art. Yeah, yeah. It might, it might actually be better. But you, I think the trouble is if you build like really high quality art and stuff too soon, you become so attached to it. And you're like, oh, I exactly. can't throw that scene yeah. out because it's got it's amazing precious. music. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. I spent months building that. So whereas what you want in that prototype stage is just, you don't want any attachment you just want to be able to say no that bit doesn't work let's kill it or like um but then yeah we brought an artist on board this year we've just been able to go through scene by scene by scene like okay well let's draw all of those things let's draw a proper chameleon and a proper log and a proper 
the pond or whatever. And um, uh, but yeah, he's he, our our artist has worked from those really rough sketches that our concept artist did. Um, and it, but he's he he's he's really loved actually that it's he's found that a really helpful like, inspiration mm. of I, I don't know whether our level designer really intended them to be sort of so close to the final kind of shape almost but um you know he he threw them together in a matter of hours i think but it but they, they it's, been, it's been really interesting to see how they kind of survived into the the final shape of the thing so is music last or how does that the the gameplay and stuff is pretty tied to the to the music when does that come in yeah i mean in some ways if i had my time again i might have left some of the music a bit later because like okay yeah you, it's hard to with music you really kind of you need to know how long the scene is going to be and how like what's the duration of it but but yeah for some of these for some of the, like the songs in particular in our game like the song really almost came first and then we constructed a game around it almost so okay. like for those um I think for those key ones, I, like I, I think I knew pretty early on what I wanted the songs to be about. So I knew that first one was going to be Genesis three, the, the curse, um, but ending with that promise, you know, the seed, your seed will crush the head of the serpent. And um, with chapter two, we got a song about Abraham and Isaac going up Mount Moriah, and just that real wrestle of faith of, you know, God, like what you're doing, like you promised me all these things, but I don't have any children and now you're I do have one son and you're asking me to hmm. sacrifice him and that just that kind of it's a real moment of testing like, like for Adam and Eve at the tree really like Abraham's being tested in his his faith there and will he trust God and so I knew that would, would be a good basis for a song and I mean in chapter three we've we've settled on the Isaiah 53 like with the crucifixion but Isaiah 53 starts with that kind of tree kind of language of like mm-hmm. like a root out of dry ground um but again it's got quite a real kind of explanatory power of like what what's going on at the cross that jesus was pierced for our transgressions and um <clears throat> and then chapter four um uh, like revelation 22 where they're sort of back at the tree of life in, in the new creation and um some really cool kind of imagery about like, yeah jesus like lots of i am sayings and uh, but an invitation to come, come all who are thirsty and and drink and um, so yeah, really excited for that. So we've, with those ones, we've definitely started with the song and then we've been like, okay, let's let's kind of construct a game around it. But um, a lot of other music, you know, it's partly a matter of time. Actually, it's, we had to start early so that it could all get, it's you know, they can only write so many songs per year, really. So. Mm-hmm. Um, for other, you know, if you've got the chance, I think it, in some ways it's beneficial to just to wait and <laughs> music, uh, get, get your music done at the end. But one of the things that's been really, that is one of the advantages of having some of the music early is I've, like, I was able to reach out to, I said how Sword and Sorcery was such a big influence mm-hmm. on the Serpent Seed and the, the music is what makes Sword and Sorcery what it is. And that's yeah. by a guy called Jim Guthrie and, uh, quite early on I was like oh it'd be really cool if we can persuade Jim Guthrie to to write a song for the Serpent and the Seed so um last summer after I'd been to CGDC I made a video about that and the, the sort of the scene there and where I sort of there's a sort of slightly more retro computer game moment in the Serpent and the Seed I thought I can imagine Jim Guthrie's kind of chip tune style music mm. working really well there. so I reached out to him I said it's probably a long shot but we're making this game about trees and the bible and like, I'm a massive fan of Sword and Sorcery. It, it would mean so much to me if you'd be willing to write, you know, if I could commission a track. And again, he I, he wrote back and said, "Oh, it's not a long shot at all. If you're willing to pay me, you know, I'm <laughs> so, um, We've got this really cool original Jim Guthrie track where he's he's taken one of Paul Bishop Hooper's uh, themes, a sort of uh-huh. Moses music, and then he's sort of done a a sort of chip tune. Wow. That's awesome. So sort of inspired and the starting of that. So um, that's been a, like a real kind of dream come true to have him involved in a small way. So, um, and that, you know, that was only possible because we had time to play with, but he, he's quite a busy guy. So, he said, you know, as long as I can have as many months as I need to, to get around <laughs> to it, yeah. that's fine. So. 
So where are you in development right now? And do you have like a tentative release date? Yeah, so we we have built loads of the kind of most of the key kind of turning points through the game. Okay. Um, we we've got a lot of blanks <laughs> to fill in. Um, so um, and we haven't built any of chapter four yet, which is like the new new creation, sort of the, the end of the story. Um, so uh, yeah, we haven't sort of publicly committed to a release date yet. Um, I'm I'm hopeful that by the end of this year we'll we'll be in in a good place um but from time to time i'm like i, I sort of think oh gosh there is still an awful lot left to do <laughs> but i think what i've learned massive thing i've learned is deadlines are really helpful and they they focus the mind so if you say it's going to ship on this date then it's like sure you may have to cut some stuff out but it some of that stuff may not have been that important after all so mm. um at some point we will commit to a, a, a release date um but uh yeah, we, the, the, right now we're working towards, um, we're going to our first sort of secular games convention in, in, a, in just over a week's time, a week on Monday, uh, Pocket Gamer here in London. And um, I'm really excited for that because I think it will be, that's our first sort of test of how does a non-Christian audience react to it. And, um, but we, we've got an awful lot we want to get built before then. <laughs> so um, we'll see how that goes. But um, uh yeah, so we, we we even though we haven't like got the final release date, we've we've tried all the way through. We've tried to have these sort of mini deadlines where we can share bits publicly with a slightly wider audience, and that's been absolutely invaluable for us. Um, so, yeah. so where can people go to find out more about your game? Um, so the website is serpentseedgame.org, um, mm-hmm. uh, or we're on. You can find me. I'm Andy Gears on YouTube or um, Serpent Seed Game on Twitter or Instagram, TikTok, you name it. But the, if you go to serpentseedgame.org, that's where we've got our monthly email newsletter, and that's kind of the best place probably to, to stay in the loop. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for chatting.